That's right. We're starting another episode here of Courtside with Campbell and Knezevic on ESPN 1025. The game back from the holiday break, back from the disappointment of Tennessee Memphis not happening. A lot has gone on since we had our last episode. Elijah Campbell here alongside Michelle Knezevic and Michelle. Man, a lot has gone on since then. No <laughs> Tennessee, no Memphis, but Last night kicked off SEC conference play and conference play for a lot of other conferences around the country. How have we been the last few weeks? Uh, your, your viewpoint of Tennessee Memphis getting canceled and uh, from there we'll take it to, to SEC play because a lot went on last night that I'd like to get into that actually happened on the basketball floor. Yeah, we actually got some basketball last night, which was um, definitely very exciting, especially since uh, now it's finally conference play. But uh, like you touched on before, obviously our last episode before the holidays, we spent a majority of the time talking about the big in-state rivalry game we were going to have in Nashville. You and I both were going to be there. You already were at the game. I was texting you. I was running a little late in the morning. I had to do a bunch of things Saturday morning, but I was already dressed. It was so funny. And I was grabbing a coffee right before I was about to meet you over there. And my friend and I were in line getting coffee. And all of a sudden, I'm going to use my Starbucks app to like scan. And I get a Bleacher Report app. And it's like, Memphis, Tennessee is canceled. And I'm like, wait, what? I'm like, I'm, I'm about to head over there. Wait, what? And then I texted you. And I was like, what the heck is happening? Because honestly, I feel like with all of COVID and the Omicron variant surfacing again, that was almost the start of the cancellations. We hadn't really seen much. You know, you know, we hadn't gotten into bowl games yet. And now since then, we've had bowl games get canceled. We've had other basketball games get canceled or postponed. And I feel like that kind of was the first game. And you were there when it happened. I texted you, I said, Elijah, what? An hour before, an hour before tip off. I mean, it was, it, it's funny because I, uh, it was me, David James from 1025 as well, our, our partner, and uh, the athletics, John Hollinger, we were all talking next to like where the Tennessee was coming out to warm up. And we noticed it got to like the clock in the arena had got to about 70 and no one was on the floor yet. We're, we're standing on the floor because we wanted to get, you know, shots of, of warm ups and everything like that. And John Hollinger mentioned, I mean, not 30 seconds before the PA came on. It's like, wow, it's weird. No one's warming up yet. And I kind of brush it off. I don't think much of it because, like, I don't think a COVID cancellation is something that's going to happen an hour before tip-off because if they're healthy yesterday, theoretically, they were going to be healthy that day to play basketball. And sure enough, over the, the public address, not 30, 45 seconds later, they mentioned that the game was getting canceled because of some problems um, in Memphis's locker room with a COVID outbreak. And they didn't have the required amount of scholarship players to be able – to play in that game, so they ended up canceling, and Tennessee ended up doing a an inter squad scrimmage there on the floor for the several hundred people that were already in attendance. Because, like, I mean, the place was starting to fill up a little bit whenever the announcement was made, which was strange enough too. I mean, the amount of confusion in that arena rose as the millisecond that that announcement was made. So it was a very weird bizarre experience and and like you said like it set the tone for what else happened in sports with all our bowl games getting canceled uh, there was at one point I think over 50 to 70 college basketball programs on pause yeah. because of an overcome variant spread within their locker rooms so it it ended up being something that college basketball is, has had to deal with and mm -hmm. it's been really unfortunate to have some of these games canceled or Teams play shorthanded, kind of like what we saw with Tennessee last night. Last night, yeah. Well, I think what we're seeing is, you know, we're getting into the winter months. This is usually flu season. And we at 1025 The Game obviously cover the Titans. We've seen a lot of their players get put on COVID reserve. Mm -hmm. um, they've now changed the rules. So it is only five days. So hope, and the CDC's changed the rules of five day quarantine. Um, you know, if you're asymptomatic, the NHL was on pause. We saw that with the Nashville Predators. They just started back up again last night. So, I mean, hopefully what we're seeing now is if people are vaccinated, that this is not as deadly or fatal, but they are saying the Omicron is more contagious. But hopefully, you know, moving forward, it'll be 
something along the lines of you guys have to sit out for a couple games or you have to be in quarantine for X amount of days. Um, but people are still going to be able to, you know, make it through. And I really thought we were over this, but. <laughs> Certainly <laughs> talked like at the beginning of the year where like we finally get a regular season of college basketball with no <laughs> interferences. And I think that's what, and everything kind of fell after that. I think we might've just jinxed it. We might've put the cart before the horse on that one, Michelle. But on a lighter note, we did get to finally see some SEC basketball last night. Uh, I had to look up the rest of what happened for Tennessee's game. When I went into work this morning, uh, Will, our overnight producer, he's a big Tennessee fan. And I was like, hey, can you give me a play-by-play of what happened the last uh, <laughs> last uh, 10 minutes or last five minutes of the game? Because I swear, these nine o'clock tips, I'm exhausted. <laughs> I was exhausted. I didn't have to be up. You do the more, you do mornings, you do morning radio. You're up at like 4 a.m. Like, yeah. that's late for you. That was late for me, but yeah. I, I old manned it and forced myself to stay awake. And that was a very interesting game, Tennessee and Alabama was, because it was maybe what, 45 minutes before tip off? It was announced that there was going to be no Kennedy Chandler and no John Fulkerson. I don't know about you, Michelle, but the first thing that came into my head when I thought about that, when I heard that news, was, oh, man, Tennessee's done. Like, there's just no way they're going to generate enough offense. I know Alabama's defense wasn't like it was last year. They were, like, the number two defense in college basketball last year. That was the strength of their team. It's not the strength of their team this year, but I thought even without or even with their defense being disappointing so far this year, that Tennessee wasn't going to generate enough offense, and that certainly wasn't the case. Well, and that was one of the big points we talked about how beneficial Kennedy Chandler was to this Tennessee team, how last year they didn't really have a player who was able to facilitate and make plays and use his weapons around him. And we've seen, you know, highs and and lows from Kennedy so far this year, but the glimpses of, you know, really good point guard play and being able to just have good court vision and really run the court, we're like, oh, they, this is what they needed on this team, right? Can't wait to see him develop. Can't wait to see how he grows as a player, just getting more comfortable at that point, more comfortable with his players around him. And then when you hear that, you know, I was watching the game, the SEC game before, Kentucky, Missouri, mm-hmm. and then obviously Tennessee, Alabama was after, which was kind of the more sought after game, just you thought it was going to be. Um, a tougher game, which it was. It was a closer game. But then you hear that news, and you're like, oh, well, not sure how close this game is going to be. Alabama's probably going to roll over Tennessee. But I would say, we talked about this this morning on Robbie and Rex Road, pretty promising for Tennessee fans, the fact that Tennessee was able to have a performance like that without those two key players. And, I mean, Alabama was pretty much the main SEC team we talked about being one of the biggest threats this year, not only in the SEC tournament, but talking about them going back to back, winning the SEC, talking about them making a run in the bubble. But honestly, they've kind of been, I mean, they came out with the win last night, but Tennessee didn't have two key players. So I wouldn't, I mean, yeah, it's an SEC, it's a conference win from Alabama, but that's not the best they're going to see that Tennessee team. Oh, and that's, and, like, yeah, you're right, because right, it'll go down as a quad one win for Alabama, which is huge, especially when you're debating seeding here in a couple months, whenever that becomes a thing. And which is actually going to be, like, so soon, I feel like. Yeah, it's, it's, it's flying by. And then, obviously, when we look back on this game in a couple months to talk about, you know, Alabama seeding, this game is going to come up because it's going to be on paper a quad one win. But I came away from that game more disappointed in Alabama than I was anything else because I think Tennessee just out-toughed them for 90% of that game. Alabama was able to finally hit some threes late in the game. And Alabama did what, to me, they had a problem with against Memphis. Like, Memphis ended up beating the fire out of them in the second half of that game because they couldn't get enough stops. Mm -hmm. And they were wasting possessions on three-point shooting with guys who aren't fantastic three-point shooters. And that's my biggest gripe with this team. Like, I will be the first to tell you, I love Nate Oates. I love the philosophy of letting it fly. I love the thought of like the math behind shooting more threes than twos. I completely get it. I am a huge advocate for it. But the thing is, if you're going to do that, you got to do it with guys that can shoot the ball that well. Last year, Alabama had eight players that shot over 35% from three. Eight. 
That's yeah. eight guys. It's an entire starting five and then three off the bench that are reliable three-point shooters that can shoot in the corners, from the break, or from straight away. This team has three guys that shoot over 33% from three-point range. Only three from 33. 33% is slightly below the NCAA average. They only have a three, three above average three-point shooters, and they're still chucking it up at a high rate. They shot 31 threes last night and 29 twos. They're just not a great three-point shooting team. And they shot 22% from three last night. They shot a similar percentage against Memphis. And that's how Memphis was able to continuously get stops despite not playing great defense. When you chuck up a lot of threes with guys who just can't shoot them, you're bailing out the other team defensively. And Tennessee was able to maintain their toughness throughout the game and be able to even like maintain a little bit of a rebounding edge um, on the offensive side almost until late in the game. Um, I, th I think Euros, Euros Plavs, which might have been the first player in the history of basketball to draw five fouls on box outs last night. But Tennessee was able to maintain a space in this game without having to exert themselves too hard on the defensive end. And Alabama not being able to take advantage of that, I think, is a little alarming. I think Tennessee's scoring almost 70 points in a game without the guy who makes them run and Kennedy Chandler is – a little alarming if you're an Alabama fan because I know the defense isn't the bread and butter this year. It was last year. They don't have a Herb Jones, but they're going to need to find something that resembles a Herb Jones to be able to get some stops against teams that are not going to have – are going to have more talented lineups than what they saw last night without Fulkerson and Chandler. Well, yeah, and that's the thing. It wasn't this Tennessee team – at the level they could be. It's also still early in the season. But I agree with you with the whole Nate Oates thing. Yeah, you can have that three-point game plan, but you can't have it if you don't have players who can execute. And right. I will say, though, that's one of the only reasons Tennessee lost was executing in the last couple minutes of the game. Oh if, my they, God. if they had just made, you know, a couple more of those shots, but they set up for right, the shots just didn't fall. Who was um, – his slipping – uh, the last three-point shot from Tennessee, what's his name? Uh, the, one that over. Have, the one that would have tied it or the yes. one – yeah, Victor Bailey Jr. He had yes. that three-point shot in the corner. And, and, and it, the setup – yeah, setup was perfect. The play was executed. It just – you got it. You have to make those shots in those moments like that. And hopefully, you know, it's still early in the season that later in the season when you have games that are maybe a little bit more important in the SEC tournament, you set it up right. You just ha got to have those shots fall. But – like you said, I think overall from this game, what we learned is that Tennessee can play even if they don't – like other players can step up. And not too impressed with Alabama lately. I mean, honestly, they had that big win over Gonzaga earlier in the season, and then Memphis beat them. And and then who beat them the other day? Didn't um, – Davidson ended up Davidson beating them in Birmingham. Davidson. Yep, Davidson beat them the other day, and then – I mean, yeah, they came out with the win last night, but it very much could have gone either way. It could have. And the, the funny thing about the, the Gonzaga game is a majority of the threes they took in that game were from Jaden Shackelford, who's a 42% three-point shooter. And he hit six in the first half, and that created enough of a, a gap between them and Gonzaga to be able to withstand that the rest of the game. Uh, there's too many three-pointers from guys who just – can't shoot. I mean, Shackelford didn't shoot the ball well last night. It was two for 10, but Javon Quinterly is a sub 30% three-point shooter this year. He was one for seven last night. I, they lucked out that Noah Gurley was two for four from three-point range, but he is not a fantastic three-point shooter. I don't think he was above 20% his entire career at Furman. I mean, they're not a great three-point shooting team, not even a good three-point shooting team at this, at this point in time. And that's still what they're, they're running their offense on. And that might be something that gets better later in the year when this lineup, which is different than last year's, finally comes together. Keon Ellis needs to shoot the ball a whole lot better. He was a better three-point shooter last year than he's been this year. It's, it's something they're going to have to figure out as well. And it's a, it's a really interesting indictment on this Alabama team. They're going to be one to watch, too, because the SEC is really, really good last night. I think one example you saw of the SEC being really good was Auburn LSU, the game that was on before that. A fantastic game in terms of athleticism and defensive prowess. LSU is like the number two defensive team in the country in Kempom. And they just kind of got out like got out out athleted, I guess is one way to put it. Because <laughs> Jabari Smith put on a show. 
Uh, Walker Kessler had 11 blocks. That is Anthony Davis-esque from, from Auburn. And he, he's probably the best rim protector and most valuable defensive big man in this conference, along there with Oscar Shibwe. Those guys are in a class of their own in terms of just protecting the rim. And Auburn themselves last night, by, by giving LSU that first loss, and LSU a team I think is very, very good, by doing that, I think asserted themselves as a team that we just kind of glossed over and maybe probably shouldn't have at the beginning of the year. No, I agree. I mean, a Bruce Pearl team, unfortunately, as it kills me to say, <laughs> it's, never, it's never a team you can gloss over. I think one of the reasons we did gloss over them is because they didn't really have a tough non-conference schedule. They didn't have any, you know, asterisk games or highlighted games that are like, oh, like this will be a a top 25 matchup or something like that. But I do want to make a point about LSU quick. They only shot 28% from field goal percentage and then 20% from three point. Whereas the first 16 shots of the game. Yeah. Whereas Auburn shot 43% field goal percentage and then 30% from the three point range. So yeah, you LSU's defense saved them because it ended up only being 70 to 55 Auburn winning by. But that could have, if they didn't execute on the defensive end, that could have been a way bigger gap. But, I mean, I'm not really worried about LSU, to be honest. I, I think that they really got to work on, um, you know, their offensive uh, side of things. Especially but shooting. They don't have a lot of reliable shooters. They don't. But <sighs> shooting so hard, too, it's because it's like we talk about Alabama – and they can have games where you have one player who has six threes in the first half, and then you can have other games where they have the zero. So I'm not really ruling LSU out uh, in the SEC. I mean, they still – the fact that they shot that low when it was only a 15-point game. It was miraculous. They got it within four late in the game. I know. So offensively, I think they'll be able to just scrape some things together. I think they're a scrappy team. I think they're a tough team. Um, I'm kind of – just interested to see what the rest of their year is going to look like because I mean I saw some tweets on Twitter and it's like why does LSU have a basketball program like blah blah all this stuff because you know traditionally when a fancy when you see your team just not making shots of course you want your team to be the one hitting threes and you know setting up these plays and just no passes and it's flashy it's fun but LSU saved their butts on defense you know it might not been it might not been the prettiest but if that's going to be your shooting percentage and you're only going to lose by 15 points, not too bad. Yeah. I mean, LSU's a team, like, they're kind of like Houston last year, except not as good on the offensive rebounding. Like, yeah. Houston was a good offense because they literally grabbed all of their misses and were creating second-chance points. I think it's one of the only teams I've ever seen to be, like, top 10 in efficiency while also being a horrific shooting team. <laughs> but you just get enough shots, especially around the rim when you get offensive rebounds, and it's going to make you – a whole lot better than than what you look. And this LSU team is not very good offensively. They're a little under 80 in terms of efficiency. That's not – it's pedestrian. It's pedestrian. But they have the number one defense in college basketball. As of, like, It's funny because on Kempom right now, they are at number one now despite giving up 70 last night to Auburn because as, even though Auburn scored 70 points, they still weren't scoring at a point-per-possession rate. Yeah. You know, like LSU is just tough defensively. They're physical. They will force a ton of turnovers, and they're really good at just making the game get out of control or havoc defense is what Will Wade and Shaka Smart had uh, when they were both coaches at VCU. They, they really mastered the havoc defense, and Will Wade just brought that to LSU, and now he has the athletes with Tari Eason and Xavier Pinson and, and Darius Days to be able to throw you out of that rhythm and to make you turn the ball over, and they're physical enough, too, to where you leave games against LSU all bruised because that is a tough physical team. It excited, an exciting group of individuals there that, I mean, they can still win 25 plus games. Well, and that's the thing, they're doing the hard part. You know, they're creating yeah. turnovers, they're, they're applying pressure and things like that. If you can get some offensive rebounds and some second chance shots and make, I mean, think about it. If they made two more threes and a two, it's less than a five point game. So. Yeah. Although 15 points might seem like a lot, might, if you just looked at the score, 70 to 55, oh, Auburn killed them. But actually, you know, if LSU had a couple, a couple shots go their way, that, that team's going to be pretty dangerous this year. But we talked about, I feel like this is a good transition point to another SEC game we had last night. Kentucky-Missouri, we talked about offensive rebounding and second-chance shots. <laughs> and this is not even Homer Michelle talking right now. 
but Oscar Shibue is a dangerous man on Kentucky. Oh. We are watching, th- we did, we do a segment every Thursday on Robbie and Rex Road at 745 and it's called the best and worst in sports. And he was my best in sports this week, just him in general in college basketball. Holy moly, he's absolutely incredible. He's insane. He's I mean- averaging about, I think it's like 15.8 rebounds a game. He's had four 20 point rebound games. He just broke Shaq, Shaquille O'Neal's record in Rep Arena for most rebounds, 28. That's hilarious. And in the press conference, they like told him and he was like, like he's so just like humble and like <laughs> pure, I guess you could say. Uh-huh. And they were like, you just beat Shaq's record. And he's like, what? That's but awesome. I guess there, so I follow obviously a lot of the Kentucky media people just because I worked with them while I was in Lexington and things like that. But I guess all the players on the team wanted him to get 30, but Cal took him out and was like, no, no, no. Uh, but he, have 30. Uh. he is an absolute game changer for this team. Yeah. I mean, here's the funny thing. So I, I was digging this up because I wanted to double check. Um, I know he is first in offensive rebound percentage. Like he's almost like out of every – one out of every four missed shots Kentucky has while he's on the floor, he grabs. That is an insane rate. That's number one in the country by a mile. He's number one in defensive rebounding percentage. He grabs 37% of the other team's misses, which is insane in first by a large margin. Per 100 possessions, this man is grabbing 32 rebounds total. If you round up, 30 two rebounds per 100 possessions. That's just a rate that we haven't seen in college basketball in so, so long. I mean, Kenneth Fareed at Warren State put up rebounding numbers like that in the OVC somewhat, not at, to that level. Those were cartoonish when he did that in the early 2010s. Yeah. It's even more cartoonish when you look at Oscar Sheway and what he's do, who's doing it against and doing it in a conference game in the SEC. I know Missouri's not any good, but like that many rebounds is that many rebounds. You know, like this guy is going to put up He's going to be breaking records left and right. And he's going to do that all year long. And I mean, I, he's the first pro- player I've seen in the SEC since Anthony Davis got there to be able to put yourself in the conversation of the best player in the conference without having to score a bucket, which is incredible. Well, it, and that was the reference I was going to make. That I was going to make with Anthony Davis mm-hmm. is he even didn't put up numbers like this. And no. he- <laughs> I need to go look really quick at like the least amount of rebounds he's had in a game, but I know he's had four twenty point four twenty or plus point games and he's averaging fifteen. And the amount of double doubles this man has had, it's like, oh, on the broadcast last night, he got a rebound and I don't know who's calling the game, but they're like, oh, and another double, and there's another double double for Oscar Shibue. <laughs> but it's it's the point you made. You always hear about the best player in the country is averaging 20 plus points a game and da 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 assists and they're a flashy player. And traditionally, if you look at the game, you don't see him scoring a lot of points, you know, solid. You see him making points in the paint when they need him, getting offensive rebounds, putting it in. But then when you look at the box score after and you're like, oh wow, he had 20 rebounds. Mm-hmm. It jumps off the page. It jumps off the page, first off, when you see that in one box score. But then you see the consistent rate he has had at this point in the season. And Kentucky hasn't had a really – I mean, they've had a pretty decently hard non-conference schedule, right? They had Duke. They played UNC. um, They were supposed to play Ohio State. A couple other teams in there. It's not like they've had this, like – easy breezy beautiful non-conference schedule and now we're in conference play and you still see him doing it I am he is he's the x factor for this team yeah you can talk about Ty Ty Washington yeah he's great at the point right he facilitates great but when you're getting like three to four opportunities just because of him on one possession you have to make those shots like you have to make those points and Kentucky is because of him it's amazing the effect. So I looked at last year's team, Kentucky ranked 41st in offensive rebounding percentage at 32.6%. This year they're at 44.3% and are the number one offensive rebounding team in college basketball. Because of him. That is the Oscar Sheboy effect. And it's very important to mention that he should be the front runner in the SEC player of the year discussions. And him and Walker Kessler, because Kessler blocked 11 shots in that LSU Auburn game last night. 
those guys are, are the two best bigs, it seems, in, defensively in this conference. And it's going to be a lot of fun to watch those two guys from here on out. And if, if last night's any indicator, the SEC is going to be a wild ride too. Another team, right before we go to break here, Mississippi State, that was my SEC sleeper, took it to Arkansas. I know there's no J.D. Note. That's pretty significant because he's a big part of Arkansas's offense. But Mississippi State, double-digit win at home against Arkansas. That's a veteran team that even though they started off a little slow and had some disappointing losses, yeah. is a team that's going to slip up and beat a lot of people they probably shouldn't. So that's a, a fun one to watch as well. But we'll go ahead and take a quick break. We'll come right back, and we'll discuss our biggest disappointments of the non-conference schedule. We have our favorite moments from 2021 because at the time of recording, we are a day away from 2022. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and break down our favorite moments from 2021. We have give and go still a whole lot more as you're listening to Courtside with Campbell and Knezevic here on ESPN, 1025 The Game. Well, these teams have had some bad days. As you can hear, the, uh, the class 2006 hit bad days coming back from break <laughs> here. And Well, we're going to get to the disappointment so far of the 2021-2022 season. Non-conference play is over. We've talked about teams that have surprised us earlier in the show. It's, I, I guess, time to talk about the disappointments a little bit here. And we both agreed to come up with one big one each there's there's one in the state that's been pretty darn disappointing and there's a couple nationally that i found especially within the sec that haven't lived up to the expectations that this show this esteemed and fine program courtside with camel knezevic has put out for them michelle what are you thinking here who's your biggest disappointment so far in the 2021 non-conference slate elijah you kind of alluded to it right there memphis point yeah. blank i touched on this I think two episodes ago, we were talking about, you know, risers, fallers, where we see teams, just so inconsistent. And maybe because we have had a lot of hype around them and with Imani Bates committing there and Penny Hardaway coaching and having one of the best draft classes, we're like, oh, this team has to be amazing. They, they have all the pieces. Now we just got to see how they work together. We saw a glimpse of it beating Alabama the other night. And then we were really hyped up for that Tennessee game. We're going to see how they played. And then another loss to Tulane last night. A really, like, really bad loss. Uh, that, there's, no, there's no way of, of beating around that bush. Tulane is not a team that rates out very well. And that's going to be – it's a, a big blemish to the resume. Well, and one of the biggest question marks for me, at least for this team, is defensively they're not playing awful. They're playing fine defensively, but you'd think these top recruits, they're, they're great shooters. They cannot offensively put anything together. Yeah. I mean, the Alabama game, they, they played good. They played, you know, solid win on their part, but they're not going to make it into the tournament if they can't have solid wins in their conference. It's not like they're in the SEC or the ACC. They're playing in the American Conference, and nothing against the American Conference, but it's not a Power Five conference. And you're not going to make it into the tournament if you can't at least win out in your conference schedule. It's not like you're losing to a Houston. It's not like you're losing to a Cincinnati. Like, come on. It's just – it's a big disappointment, honestly, especially because they're in-state. I I love rooting for an underdog team, a non-Power 5 team that is supposed to have a great year, a lot of hype around them. But – and another part of it, too, Benny Hardaway hasn't been shy about it, that there's been locker room issues. There's been – you know, selfish issues, people not wanting to play to win for the team, people just wanting individual success, individual draft stock, rising, and things like that. Yeah, I mean, this <laughs> with the way the expectations were this year, this team had the talent level to be a consistent top 10 to 15 team all season long. They hit that bad losing streak where, I mean, bad. Ole Miss is whatever – Georgia is a horrific loss. Yeah. I mean, Georgia is worse. I mean, Georgia last night got beat double digits to Gardner Webb at home. Georgia's really bad. You can't lose that game. Georgia beat Memphis. Memphis lost that game to Murray State, who is, is, Murray State's good. I think they're a solid OVC team, but that's, that's not one you should lose, especially at home. This Memphis team's now fallen out of the top 65 in net. So if you just think about it really quick, do you know their record off the top of your hand, top of your head? For Memphis? Yeah. Memphis, I believe, is six and five right now. Okay. Should it be Georgia? 
Yep. Should it be Murray State? Easily. Uh, should it be Tulane yesterday? By a mile. Oh, that's my forgetting. There was another early one that they lost to, and I can't think about it. But there we go. That's three right there. So what? They would have been eight or nine in – I'm bad at math. Nine and three? Should nope. be, yeah. About, yeah. about nine – or about eight. nine and three. Eight and three. Okay, whatever. I'm bad at math. But the point is, they should have won three more games <laughs> right there. But right. I, I pose this question to you, Elijah. Do you think this is more about – the team and the players, or do you think that this is more about Penny Hardaway's coaching? I think it's the perfect storm of the two. I mean, I don't think offensively they run a lot of stuff that puts the players in the best position to win these games. I feel like they've really wasted Jalen Duran, a guy who is a legitimate top 10 to 15 NBA prospect in this next year's draft. They have wasted his talents they don't put him in advantageous positions to be a better offensive player, which contributes to some of the low offensive outputs. I think there's way too much trust in Imani Bates right now, who is not a starting caliber player in college basketball. As much talent as he possesses, he doesn't give them anything. I mean, it, it's hard to say that he's even a good player at this level right now because he's not shooting the ball well. He's turning the ball over a lot. They haven't figured out this team. This team also hasn't bought in, you know. It's amazing what – has happened with this team in terms of buy-in and uh, a lot of stalling on the offensive side of the ball. And I think the biggest thing with them is lack of offensive continuity. And that's something that coaches have to do. Like coaches have to have a hand in the continuity of your offense. Like these guys are young. They're one of the youngest teams in college basketball. They have an incredible blend of young talent and coaching has to be able to be a little more of a guide along the way. That's kind of where I'm, I'm seeing it. I will make this point, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be a homer on Kentucky or anything like that, but I think this is a nice example of what Coach Calipari does every year when he does have a starting lineup of freshmen. He has a system where this year's a different year because they have a lot of um, you know, transfers and older guys on the team, and we talked about that, how this is one of the oldest Kentucky teams. But I think it says a lot about coaches who take in three to four starting freshmen every year and the way they coach them. Mm -hmm. I think you can see a team with an enormous amount of talent on, on Memphis, right? We talked about one of the best recruiting classes. But to be able to get high school seniors, you're 18 years old, yeah. to be playing – like college basketball, good elite college basketball so soon is really hard. I mean, yeah. they, they just don't have the years under their belt that some of these like veteran teams have. Like Gonzaga, these guys have been playing college basketball for four to five years. Then you have your, you have your fifth years and then you have your like COVID fifth years now. So they've actually been playing for six years. Super seniors super, super seniors. We talked about this was the year of the transfer portal and just grad transfers and just so many older guys. They just have, so being able to get these freshmen at at least a level where they're being able to compete, I think it says a lot about just the coaching, mm -hmm. how hard it is to do, how their locker room isn't buying into what Penny's selling. And Maybe just if this was too early of a jump as a head coach for Penny Hardaway. It's a reasonable point. I, I think like John Calipari, Mike Krzyzewski, all these guys that, that rake in these one and dones make it look so much easier than it actually is. And I think this example should put the whole, will they get the best 18 year olds every year? Like how much coaching do you really need to do? There's a lot of coaching that goes on that. There's a lot of team building that's required to make all of that work. And I think this should be the, uh, the best example of that's not all it takes to coach basketball at the collegiate level. There's a whole lot more than just recruiting. There's a whole lot more to having a team that is able to make runs in March than just having the best high school seniors every year and not being able to, to blend them. So that's and a really good example. Really quick before we head to your team, just because – you're projected to go to the, the NBA, the NBA drafts off potential. 
Yeah. Right. The MBA has all the facilities of everything and the training and that's your job. You have no other outside noise of school and just being an 18 year old in your social life and college in general. Yeah. Monty Bates going to go to the MBA, his physique, everything about him. That's what the MBA is for, but for being able to, you know, develop these guys, but mm -hmm he still has to perform at the college level. I don't know. It's going to be really interesting um, to see, but just kind of disappointing because we both are really excited to see Memphis. Disappointed we didn't get to see them in Bridgestone. But, I mean, it's still early in the season. If they win out their conference, they win the American conference, there's still a chance for them to get in the bubble, um, maybe if they can get their stuff together. But what about you, Elijah? What is your team that you have been most disappointed with um, so far this season? I'm going to go with Arkansas. I think Arkansas is a team that I was seriously considering to be a top 10 team in the country. They have a lot of different transfers. So you figured it might take a little while for them to gel, but they had some decent wins earlier in the season. I thought the Kansas state win was a pretty solid one. It gets a team that is a little more established as a group and as a unit. Kansas state has a lot of super seniors and guys have been there for a while on that team. I thought the win against Cincinnati was good because Cincinnati is a tough team, even though it's yep. not very skilled. I think they're tough. They're always, they'll always have a solid basketball team, though. Cincinnati, they always bring it. They always defend. They always rebound. No matter who the, the coach is, it's wild how over the strands, like the span of the last three or four head coaches, even some of the bad ones, like they've been able to, like the bad years, like the last couple of years have been great, but there's still like that imprint of Mick Cronin's, um, Mick Cronin's like impact on that team. Like they still have his demeanor. Mm -hmm. But I mean, since starting 9-0, they lost to Oklahoma by 22. Oklahoma was a, a decent team. Uh, they're really well coached. I love Porter Moser. I think he's one of the best coaches in college basketball, but that's not a very talented team at Oklahoma. They got gutted by transfers, la the transfer portal last year. And then they turn around and lose to Hofstra at home by seven. Um, or I guess it's a, a neutral site game, but still. Like that, like Hofstra is a team that's outside the top 120 in Ken Palm. That's a really, really bad loss. And then Mississippi State beat them pretty good last night without J.D. Note, which is expected. But if you look at Arkansas's, like, straight up their, their resume right now, they're a bubble team. I mean, they're 10 and 3, but they're 45 overall in Ken Palm. They're number 90 in net. Like, they're flirting with being outside the top 100 huh. in net. And that is a significant indicator of teams that – are on the bubble. Like you have to have a decent net rating. And the reason theirs is so low is because they've lost three games and their strength of schedule is outside the top 300. They're at 302 in strength of schedule. Yeah. Their, a lot of their non-conference wins aren't great wins. And they are very pedestrian when it comes to quad one and quad two games or two and two in quad one and quad two games. But the expectation for this team was be a top 10 to 15 team all year long, kind of like what last year's was. And obviously, when you lose Moses Moody, it, you're not going to be what you were last year. He was a significant contributor, and he makes a lot of things different because he was that good of a player. But I just had a lot higher hopes for Arkansas coming into this year. And the Hofstra loss was the big eye-opener. They flirted around with some close losses. And Gardner-Webb hung around a little too much for comfort. Um, Mercer was only a 13-point win because Mercer's at, outside the 200 in Kempom as well. Central Arkansas is like they played teams like Central Arkansas and Little Rock that are outside the top 300 in Ken Palm as well. So like they haven't been tested that often. And when they have been, they haven't passed it frequently with the Oklahoma loss being the worst of the bunch, being the worst of the bunch in terms of how they looked. Hofstra being the worst opponent they've lost to. So I got to give uh, my big disappointment award to, uh, to Arkansas. And it's, uh, it could be fixed because there is a lot of, a lot of makeover. J.D. Note will eventually get healthier. Chris Likes will, and uh, Stanley Amudi will eventually become better contributors once they're more entrenched into the team. Because, I mean, sometimes when you have teams of all these transfers, it, it takes a while. And Adi's Tony's the same way. He's coming from Pittsburgh. But once they get that settled, they'll probably be a different team. But as for right now, they're, they're definitely the most disappointing. So we'll go ahead and take a quick break. Running up against the clock here, we'll come back. We'll go ahead, give our best, our favorite moments, rather, from 2021. And then, of course, we always end each show with three and out. You're listening to Courtside with Campbell Knezovic here on ESPN 102.5 The Game. All right, when you hear that, you know what it means. It means we are ending one year and going to another. 2021 is only about 
well, about 24 hours and, and some change, you know, remaining. We're almost into 2022, and it's time to reflect on our favorite college basketball moments in the year of our Lord 2021. Michelle, you'll go ahead and kick us off here. Uh, what is your, I guess, favorite more or most interesting moment? I guess when you look back on the year of 2021 in the college basketball realm, what's the one thing you're gonna, your brain's going to go to? So we talk about moments in college basketball, and obviously the tournament's going to come up. I mean, it was just great to have the tournament back this year. It's crazy to think in 2020, we didn't know the future of college basketball. We didn't know what was going to happen. Um, so one of my favorite moments was Gonzaga, and when Jalen Snuggs hit that incredible shot and then ran up on the scores table and was like, ah, oh, to go to um, the final game, national championship, Obviously, Baylor ended up winning, but that moment sticks out in my head. Just I can like see it in my head, like him just run up on the table. It was pretty incredible. Um, but then switching over to the women's tournament, I think that there was a lot of movement in 2020 or sorry, 2021 for the women's game. I think that there was so there was a TikTok that went viral. It was a Oregon women's basketball player, and she essentially posted from the tournament so it was uh you think that something about you think women's basketball and men's basketball are treated the same way or blah blah oh. something like that and she posted essentially what their weight room at the tournament looked like and then what the men's uh, weight room looked like and just the different facilities the different resources that they had at the tournament and it, it gained a lot of traction and i think that is what the NCAA needed. They needed to be exposed and they needed yeah. to be shown, like, what are you doing, right? Oh, you, say, yeah. you say, oh, they're equal, blah, 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 all this stuff. But that's not even close to being equal. No. Whatsoever. Absolutely. I think that's their weight room had like five, five weights or yeah. something like that crazy. Yeah. Yeah, whereas the the guys room had incredible and some people might say oh that's your best well actually it is because it made people in the decision making chairs open their freaking eyes and be held accountable for the inequalities in basketball yeah. uh, so that was definitely one of my best and now the women's game is actually getting the branding of march madness so if people don't realize march madness originally only was for the men's tournament. And you see that one shining moment, you see just all the branding of March Madness, but now they're bringing it over to the women's game. And th that's big because March Madness itself revenues an incredible amount of money each year, like insane. And you can afford to invest in the women's game because there is an audience out there. I don't care if people are like, oh, there's not an audience or whatever. There's um, an audience. There is an audience. They just need the opportunity to show it. And if they're not given the same amount of resources, then they're already set behind. So I think that that was great for the women's game um, on that side of things. And then I do have two more, but they're NBA slash WNBA, but we could show them some love. Candace Parker, we yes. love a lady Vol. Uh -huh. um, she heads to Chicago and wins the WNBA championship. Just love her. She also just um, won player of the year again an incredible athlete all around. And then she was in the parade in Tennessee uh, a couple of weeks ago, which is kind of cool. And then also Giannis finally got his trophy. So what better, what better player? He's just so kind. He's so funny um, when he does all of his press conferences and everything like that. So finally happy that he got a ring and I don't think it's going to be his last ring. <laughs> Probably not. Uh, anytime, anytime you can drop a 50-point game or series ceiling game six, you're going to immortalize yourself for as long as you play, even when you're, whenever he's done playing basketball as well. Those are really, really good. Back to the point of the, the, the women's facilities getting upgraded. It's funny how you know the NCAA – how I know the NCAA knew they were wrong is that they had the ability to fix it like that. Whenever the public saw it and, ever, and whenever it, you know, got – uh, a flashlight put on it yeah. and the light was shown the NCAA fixed it like that. If they could fix it like that, they could have fixed it before the problem actually arose. And that's the thing. They knew they were wrong. Uh, and when they were called out, it's essentially just like, if you're exposed, you know, you're doing something wrong or, you know, you're turning like 
like you're like pretending like you don't see it. And you made a great point with that. They fixed it like that. And they're having to fix it like that because the public's holding them accountable, which I think is good. Expose them. That women's basketball player, she just, she just helped the future of the game. You know, she might not be able to see the direct impact because she only has a couple more years of college. I'm not sure what year she is, but she's helping the game overall, which is Mm -hmm. essentially what we need to do. There's a significant impact. It goes beyond just what she does on the floor. Um, I think my favorite moment was definitely, I I love mid-majors. I love the underdog. It's my favorite part of college basketball. And I think mine's got to be Oral Roberts' run. Only one other time we ever seen a 15 seed make it to the Sweet 16, and that was 2013's Florida Gulf Coast team that went past Georgetown and San Diego State. This team, led by Max Aceves, who was the leading scorer in the country, defied all logic. I mean, not many teams are coming out of the Summit League and are winning games in the NCAA tournament. And Max Aceves was really the, the, the star of the tournament, if you think about guys who you never heard of before, and then pulls off an upset against an Ohio State team that I thought could have made the Final Four, yeah. and then turn around and beat a solid Florida team that is bringing a lot of guys back this year, and that's already had a decent start to their season. Kevin O'Banner on that Oral Roberts team also making his stock go high enough to where Texas Tech was able to poach him. Now he's playing major Power Five college basketball. It, is, it was remarkable to see what that Oral Roberts team did, uh, a very little-known school, being able to get put on the biggest, brightest moment, and then only being a couple minutes away from upsetting Arkansas. They were a last-second shot away from upsetting Arkansas and going to the Elite Eight as a 15 seed and a school that no one's heard of. Well, and that's the incredible thing about college basketball is those players on that team, they're probably not going to play after college. No. Right? There's, there's a slim chance maybe a few could play overseas or something like that, but – this is their moment. You've got the ACC and you've got the SEC where these elite players are on national television every week. You know, they're, they're on SEC network. They're on primetime games. They're, they're at these elite tournaments. They're going to go to the NBA or they're going to have a solid career overseas or in the G league. Like this is at least for those seniors on that team, this is the last time they'll probably play basketball in their yeah. life. And that's, I mean, one of the reasons I love March so much is because you see teams like this, even a couple of years ago with Loyola Chicago, I know they're a little bit, you know, more high profile as a team, but you love those stories. And I mean, these guys are playing for their life. Yeah. And it's, and for the schools, I mean, we'll always know like about Oral Roberts now because yeah. these kids put their school on the map. Like, and we'll always know who George Mason is because their final four run in 2006. Or and, UMBC a couple of years ago when they beat Virginia. Go it's Golden amazing. Retrievers. <laughs> it's ama- it is amazing what the, this tournament does for e- schools like that. And that's personally my favorite part of it. It's the parody. That's why you play the game. And mm-hmm. that's why um, it makes the best postseason product in all of college basketball. So that's my favorite moment from 2021. We'll go ahead now, end the show with a little bit of give and go. Michelle, I believe it's your turn to to uh, yeah. give out the, the questions and we'll decide if I, if I give or if I go. Okay, we talked about them earlier in the show. Oscar Shibue will be a top three pick in the NBA draft. He will either gonna, go one, two, or three. I wanna give. Um, I, I don't know if I even see him as a lottery pick just because of Forwards in the NBA run a lot of different stuff out of um, chin and zoom actions, things that require you to be a really good passer. Uh, most guys that are getting a lot of good minutes in the NBA right now at his position have become a lot better passers. And like think like Evan Mobley last year for USC, top three pick in the draft, an elite rim runner, elite screener, elite rebounder, elite shot blocker, but he could pass the ball a little bit. I think the one thing that Oscar Shibwe needs to be able to do is to be able to distribute at a higher level or at least be able to – like, the thing is – he can. That's the thing is he can. He just hasn't been – it's not his role in this offense. It's the Bam Adebayo syndrome because Bam Adebayo played the same role that Oscar Shibwe is in right now. And what is Bam Adebayo right now for Miami? One of the best passing bigs in basketball right now, and he can kill you in many different ways with defensive versatility and with his ability to be a part of an offense that when the ball comes to him – it's not the possession's not dying when the ball comes to him. And I think that's the biggest thing she needs to be able to do if he's once he's able to become a better passer, 
And I think he's a willing passer. It's just a skill that you got to get better at. Um, I think once he's able to do that, he will become a very solid NBA option. But as of right now, he's the best rebounding prospect in this draft by a mile. So his value is going to be there and someone's going to take him. I just don't think we'll be within the top 10. I, I'm going to agree with you. I'm going to give this one too, but I think he could be a lottery pick if yeah. I think he could go in the first round if we see, okay, so right. We're going into conference play right now. If we see him continue with the rebounding he has, but also step it up in another one of the categories, right? If he could get some block, some big time blocks in there and then just continuing with this double, double, this double, double service he's been serving. We just, uh -huh. I think I told you we were on a break, but 10 out of the last 12 games, he's had a double-double. If he can continue that against higher-level teams, you know, in conference play and just be consistent with it throughout the year, I know comparing somebody to Anthony Davis is pretty incredible because we know how Anthony Davis is. We've seen his career, uh, where he went in the draft, everything, right? Future Hall of Famer, yeah. Yeah, future Hall of Famer, exactly. But, I mean, I, you see glimpses of what he could be. Um, so we'll see. I know that's a big comparison. We also have compared Imani Bates to Kevin Durant. So, <laughs> yeah, those comparisons they, they they can be they can be a little loose, but a little loose. But yeah. you know what I, you know what I'm saying. Basically, just how we were saying, he's one of the top players in college basketball, not because of points, because of another category on the board. Yeah, he affects the game exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Next, we've got a little we've got a little Memphis Grizzlies action here. John Morant is making his all star all star resume right now. Oh, I'm going with that 100%. I think he should be one of the top vote getters in the Western Conference. I know the Western Conference is loaded with great point guards. It's loaded with great talent. But what John Morant's done with this Grizzlies team has made them not just like a perennial playoff team. This is a team that I seriously can see winning a playoff series this year. Like they, while they still have work to do on defense, offensively they are fun. John ja Morant is just one of those guys that makes everyone on that team better. And that a guy that has that kind of impact the way John ja Morant does on that team is remarkable. I know the Grizzlies played well without him, and surprisingly so. But when John ja Morant's on the floor, this Grizzlies team is not just the most fun team to watch in this area. It's one of the most fun teams to watch in all of basketball. It's been remarkable. And he, he is must-watch TV. And I think he is, without a doubt, is going to become an all-star, maybe even an all-star all -star starter alongside Steph Curry. You know, like that's, that's where I'm viewing him right now, the season he's having. No, I, com I completely agree. And I think his ceiling is so high, and it's only up onwards and upward for John ja Morant. I mean, you talk about it's the Warriors show this year. It's the Suns show this year. Uh -huh. They beat the Warriors. They've beat the Suns, and they've also beat the Lakers last night. And they're the only team in the NBA to do that. John Moran also has recorded two 40-point games. I think that's the first time in franchise history. Um, oh. So he's putting this franchise on the map. I mean, the Memphis Grizzlies, they're not, they're not a Warriors. They're not a Lakers. They're not a Celtics franchise. He is becoming their franchise player. He's going to do what Giannis has done in – I fully believe he is going to do for the Memphis Grizzlies what Giannis has done for the Milwaukee Bucks. I do believe he could bring a, he could bring, I mean, who knows, maybe this year's basketball, anything can happen. I still think the Warriors, they're pretty incredible, but I will say, I think he is going to do great things for this, is doing great things for this franchise and will continue to give me that John Moran. I could easily see him as an all-star. Okay. Lastly, Penny Hardaway's time as a head coach, head coach, is short-lived and will not make it through next season. I think I'm going to give that one just because I, if, he, if he was in another spot, if he wasn't at Memphis and he didn't have that history, I think the leash would be a whole lot shorter. I think it's getting shorter by the year, but I think they're going to give him some time, especially if he can get Bates to come back. And give him a give you him. Think that's a, actually realistic. Uh, I think because he won't be NBA draft eligible. I think the biggest thing is does Bates transfer or does he go overseas to play or like G League Ignite or, or something like that. Exactly. I think if they can if he can get him to come back, 
if they end strong this year, get him to come back and show that he can develop these kind of guys, I, I think he stays around for a while. I think if he's in any other market that's a big college basketball market with the results he's had, it would be hard for him to, to last much longer. The leash would be an almost non-existent. But I think it does help him a lot with the familiarity of being from Memphis and being the icon in Memphis that he is as well is going to help buy him a lot more time than it would anywhere else. Well, I think that's what's saving him at this point is his name. Yeah. And 100%. the reason he's able to recruit is because he's Penny Hardaway. Yeah. Think about it. These kids look up to him. He's an icon in basketball. My coach is Penny Hardaway. Or, for instance, you could – Vanderbilt, Jerry Stackhouse. These kids grow up watching these players. So uh -huh. I think that – this one was hard for me. Because I agree with the fact that if he was at a different school and he wasn't like an all-star in that city or just in general, the uh, leap would be a lot shorter and his coaching, head coaching tenure would be pretty short-lived. But I think they'll give it maybe another two or three seasons. But I think if it continues this way and they don't see changes, I think it could be kind of short-lived for him. So I think we agreed on everything. <laughs> I, I believe so, but – um, it's, it is really interesting to see that dynamic and how that continues to, to uh, affect the, the team down the line. But another great week. This is our last episode of 2021. I know. Last one. Next time we, we go at this, it'll, it'll be next year. I know. Next year and going to throw out a bunch more pod. Now it's going to like get, really get rolling. We got conference well, play. You know, before we know it, it's seating. It's it's conference tournaments. It's, it's, it's going to be a wild ride. I'm very, very excited for it. I know you're excited for it. Um, hopefully we've got a bunch of fun things in store for courtside with Campbell and Knezvik and basketball season is finally here. And I am just, I'm here for it. It's fantastic. This, this is where it starts getting really fun once conference season starts. And it's nice to have kicked off the games that we did last night, but next time we, uh, we address you guys, it will be, in 2022 from Elijah Campbell, my partner, Michelle Knezovic. You've been listening to Courtside with Campbell Knezovic right here on Nashville's home for college basketball, ESPN 1025 The Game.